So I really have to stop doing this. I really, really do. This being deciding I don't like a video after recording it weeks in advance and being terribly efficient and then re-recording it on the day it's supposed to go out. And actually in this case, re-recording it for the second time on the day it's supposed to go out after the time it's supposed to go out. But that's because this is an interesting one for the year of technology because it's going to start off a lot of the ideas and concepts which are going to be discussed in this year. In that, I want to look not just at the technology, but at the context and nuance around the technology. And Gerd, of course, is an important part of that. Economic warfare is an important part of it. Naval warfare doesn't develop because people like using ships. Naval warfare doesn't develop because people like boats. Naval warfare develops because people have to use the sea. The very heart of naval warfare is and always will be the control of movement. If you are able to move things from A to B across the sea, then you are able to use the sea. Now, if you have local control to see, i.e. you have a convoy, that can be enough. You don't need grand strategic control to see. If you can deny control to see, even local, by blockade, or by minefield, or by submarine, to stop the other side using the sea, that can also be a method of winning a war. At its base point, the sea is an open access commons. It is a freedom of movement. We can have all the laws we want around it. And trust me, I'm going to be talking some of the things about international maritime law. Some point in this year, I might get some of my really, really expensive books out. What do I mean by really expensive books? Well, I have naval history books. They cost a couple of hundred, sometimes a few, sometimes more than that pounds. Maritime law books, especially some of the older original founding, founding books, I'm lucky in that some of them were a gift to me from a professor, who, an old professor who was retiring and who his own family weren't interested in them and he basically said, have them. I'm retiring. I don't want these cluttering up my retirement. Admittedly now a couple of them are on loan back to him because he's decided to do some work on the subject. But we'll leave that to one side. Those books are expensive enough that I don't even allow myself to buy more than one a year and I have to write a business case to myself before I spend the money. That's what we're talking about. So, for most people, if you want and are interested in this sort of thing, if you want to have an idea of the stuff which leads to the 1708 Act, which we'll be discussing at some point, then you've got the War at Sea under Queen Anne. Always a fun one. This was by John Helly Owen. And if you want to understand slightly more, eco uh, more modern economic warfare, pretty much a huge chunk of how the War Was Won by Phillips, Pace and O'Brien. As you can see, this one is not well read at all, if you... Uh, <laughs> I haven't nearly broken the back of it. <laughs> this one looks like I've done. Yeah, um, I've had those a while. They're good books. They are very, very good books, and they have lots of interesting content in them. Now, this is another good book, which I hope has interesting content in it. Uh, I, I can't be t too uh, about it. You know, it's my own. I have to be honest and impartial on this channel. There are things I would like to change in it. There are things I would like to add more into it. But there are things. It's the fact is, <sighs> I'm a perfectionist. And I got it to the highest quality I could under the circumstances. And I'm proud of that quality. Would I like to push it more? Yes. But I'll probably never be happy with any of my works. 
which is why going and writing the books myself without a publishing company is probably going to be even worse. So I am going to be good and keep and put updates regularly on Patreon, and I want my patrons to hold me to that. Um, not in Jan starting in January, but starting in February, March, April, reminding me if I haven't put an update or an excerpt of the work I've written on there, there for that month. Please do. Remind me. Thank you. I know. Seriously, you do enough. You do so much for me already with just the support and the financial support you provide. I shouldn't be putting extra burden on you, but um, a little bit of burden of um, encouragement. And before anyone asks, the reason I'm not posting those things to YouTube is um, because we're patron there behind a paywall, and that means a copyright still sort of okay. If I publish it as bits on this gourd or YouTube. Uh, my friend who's a lawyer said it gets interesting. Especially when you're going to be doing digital publishing anyway. Life is fun. So, we normally start off with... Well, with what we call gear de course. Commerce raiding, a privateering sort of in the 16th century of the 1500s. That's when we have things like letters and mark being coming about. And this important thing, okay? If you have a letter of mark, you are not a pirate. That is an important thing, okay? Pirates are doing something illegal, which they can get hung, hung for, okay? If you have a letter of mark, you cannot be hung for what you're doing, theoretically. Theoretically, you have been given a commission, you have been given a letter of mark by a government to say you are doing this under their permission, under their agreement. So you're a private company, a private individual, paying for the warship, paying for the crew, paying for all the weaponry, all the ammunition, all those sort of things. And yes, you get all the prize money if you capture the ships. But it's very cheap for a government. But if you are a privateer... You have a government saying that you are not doing something illegal. You are not a criminal. You are a form of mercenary. A self-financing mercenary. In fact, you're probably the form of mercenary which governments most like. Because, you know, they don't have to pay anything for you. They just give you a piece of paper and it makes you happy. This is important. But it's also important for governments in a certain period. If you don't have large standing navies or navies which can maintain ship and have the infrastructure industry to maintain ships in ordinary, you will want to have a larger pool of ships which are potential warships to call upon. Because, for example, if you're the Queen of England and you have an armada sailing away, well, you'll want to form a fleet. And most of those fleets will be formed of large ships which are owned by rich people in your country. And those rich people do not own large ships for the good of their health. Yes, they are very useful in terms of being able to be merchant vessels and making money that way. Certainly. But as my own family history would testify to, they're also very good at um, being useful as warships when war comes and making a far more lucrative trade in terms of income from capturing enemy ships. Now, my family never went to the depths of the Amazon jungle to find a tribe who was a war of the Spanish to technically would, found, uh, would count as a royal, uh, a royal ruler and f have them sign a letter of mark, so technically what I'm doing is not going to involve me getting uh, convicted for piracy. But that's because, honestly, the waters they tended to work in tended to be far more, um, how do I put this, full of internecine strife anyway. If the British weren't fighting the French, the Scots were probably fighting someone. If the Scots weren't fighting someone, then you usually found some various wars going on between the various Scandinavian kingdoms. Uh, there's always something going on somewhere. Always something going on somewhere. 
and um, yeah, you could find gainful employment. That's the other thing about privateering. Interesting thing, case point, Napoleonic Wars, some of the privateers, especially in some of the ones after the American War of Independence, were actually Americans who brought their ships to work for the British. Or Americans who brought their ships to work for the French. That's privateers. It's great. Can't make money. Which does cause some issues. And, of course, we usually trace it with all these things to these huge treasure fleets going around the world because if you have someone taking all that money on international commons it becomes very attractive basically you're talking about the high seas equivalent of the armoured car robberies that's what it is Imagine the treasure fleet as a convoy of armoured cars. And the privateers as... I don't know. Well, these days, if you were doing a Hollywood movie, they'd be like Vin Diesel's crew from Fast and Furious, a family. But um, in reality, think of it more as a loose confederate of confederacy of people who are motivated by money and a desire to maximize profits. They are going are uh, they are going after richness. And they're doing it because A they want money and B they have an excuse. They have an excuse mostly because the Portuguese, well, the Portuguese are just a major Catholic power who are rich, and that's tempting to anyone. The Spanish. Oh, the Spanish are many, many things. But mostly they are a major military power who's using this f money they're getting and they are literally draining silver and everything else they can from South America. Spices, everything they can get from South America, they are draining from South America and the Far East, same the Portuguese, but for the Spanish to finance their wars. That is what they are doing. They are all about making the money. And it's successful for them. It is. So successful that people merely work out, hang on, that's their Achilles heel. Because there is a problem when you have a belief that A, the world has been divided up for you by God, B, that you have cracked the code to provide you with limitless wealth so you can do whatever you want, and C, well, and C is always the scary one, C, that no one else is going to know what to do about you. And the trouble is the Spanish are chronically slow to react. The Portuguese are not. The Portuguese, you start messing around with their trade, they get guns very quickly and they get very he they get heavily armed ships. But there's a problem. The more guns and weapons you carry, the less of the spices you can make, so the less profit each individual ship makes. Now, if you're Spain, you could, with a larger population, etc., you could grow the number of ships, and therefore, you can make that choice. Portugal doesn't have enough; pop doesn't have the population base of sailors, etc., and the numerous and the number of them necessary to really grow their fleet sizes. Although they do a bit. Spanish start carrying these things more as begrudging, uh, begrudgingly, and it makes it just more more attractive. There is a small problem with all this, though. A small problem with all this. 
because things are not quite so clear cut. For starters, most of the legal work, and I have to admit this is critical, and this is, by the way, if you want to look up really expensive books, look up the Kindle versions in English of Hugo de Groot's works. I think they have an argument for being some of the most expensive Kindle books ever. I know there are some accountancy textbooks on there and some other legal texts on there which are probably might edge them a bit, but I can't think there are many books on Kindle which were written in the 17th century and which are that price. Then we have Baron Stowell. Well, he comes along later. He's during the uh, slave trade abolition. He has some very interesting cases which provide jurisprudence and guidance during the whole of World War I. And then there's William Murray, who pretty much his treaties are the basis for pretty much all of English and American prize law. Cute. Now, there are rules about prizes. There are rules about commerce warfare. There is an interesting bit of history, though. Most of the law of the sea is uncodified. By that, we mean it's not written down. It, therefore, closest in terms of what I would call uh, land law is common law, i.e. it's based in precedence and interpretation of precedence. And it's based in previous judgments, therefore. And trying to find similarities and links with previous judgments when you're making a new judgment. So you're looking for context and nuance which provides rela relationships between cases which can provide justification for one or other view and you wait for the ruling because every ruling is going to set new precedents. Why is this? <clears throat> because no one owns the sea. You see, on land, at a, certain, at a certain point, there is someone who is an arbiter. At a certain point, this land is part of X country, which has Y government, who will have Z laws, and they are the law of the land. Even with exclusive economic zones and all the other scenarios you have at sea, you still have the fact, a huge majority of the fact, is the sea is international. And by that means it by that we mean it's not national. And by that we mean that anything you want to get agreed as a rule at sea has to be agreed by everyone. Because if any nation doesn't agree, then any nation which is fly ship which is flying that nation's flag, it's very difficult to have them bound by that law. Also, if that nation doesn't key, uh, decide to enforce it, well, it's very difficult to have that fl that l law enforced on those nations, those flags. Why? Because a ship which is flying a flag of a nation is technically the territory of that nation. And that means, even if it's a merchant ship, there is a still technicality going there. And that means you act on that ship, you are technically invading someone else's territory. Okay, you're following this line of logic. So, you might not bother if that country's an ally and you have agreements about trade and one a ship which is wearing their flag is doing the wrong thing. Yep, you can get away with it. You probably won't bother if that nation is particularly small compared to you. Because again, what they're going to do about it. However, if we consider the sheer numbers of wars which have happened in history because of nations interfering with the merchant flag vessels or merchant vessels or let alone warships of 
other nations wearing their, you know, wearing other nations' flags, and those nations ending up being outside, you see where the problem comes in. Because it's technically an insult, and it can be a casus belli, i.e. lead to war. Now, this has all meant that there have been pretty much a codification of rules. But also, there is another factor going on here. The cruiser rules are fairly recent. They are arguably, they are far more recent in their basis than actually prize law or even the 16th century. But... Admiralty courts, we can date back quite firmly to Edward III. Mm hmm. Edward III. And the guy who won victories at Cressy and Poitiers and various other things. You know, uh, he had some interesting wars. Yeah, 1360s, Edward III. Plantagenet, King of England, Edward III. So, some of those precedents you're going back for English and American prize law, if you're deciding on these things, you can go back a really long way. I mean, you can go back so long that the vellum gets very, very interesting. Because believe it or not, vellum does not last forever unless it's very well maintained. You need to you need to take care of it. And cruiser rules. Well, I'll expand this for this one. Broadly speaking, an unarmed vessel should not be attacked without warning. Broadly speaking, the aforementioned vessel can be fired on only if it repeatedly fails to stop when ordered to do so, or is this being boarded by the attacking ship? If the attacking ship is not seeking a prize, the armed ship has the option of stopping the unarmed vessel with only intention to search for contraband. If so, the unarmed ship may be allowed on its way as it must be if it's flying the flag of non-belligerent after the removal of any of the contraband. However, if the attacking ship is seeking a prize or to destroy the ship, then adequate steps will be taken to ensure the safety of the crew. In theory, this should be taken to mean taking uh, mean taking the crew on board and transferring them to a safe port. Ergo, it's not usually acceptable to leave the crew in lifeboats, although this should only be done if they can be expected to reach a safety themselves and have sufficient supplies and navigation equipment in order to do so. Now, these are the theories. In practice, well, the Graf Spey took some crews prisoner. It didn't take other crews. It tried to take all, cap all ship's masters, captains, A.K., uh, prisoner during its cruise around in World War Two. You have the whole fun of submarines in World War One, and when they're operating under cruiser rules, because let's be honest, the submarine has no chance of taking on any crew if they're not in clo if they're not close enough to land which actually then affects where you attack them. And you can't really, if you're a submarine, do a stop and search either, because whilst you can have that as a theory, uh, being stopped on the water for quite so long, if anyone's managed to get off a radio signal or anything like that, or there's just a nearby warship which just sees as a merchant ship stops, and the smoke is just sort of sitting there. It's not moving. Why is that merchant ship not moving? And we'll go and investigate. Because a merchant ship should be moving. And you get closer and you realise there's a submarine on the surface. Cute! That's where we like them. So cruiser rules are great in that they've honestly never really been properly actually applied. They have all these lovely theories of them. But actually applying them in practice has never really happened. And the reality is that most decisions end up being bad ones which have to be resolved in Admiralty Courts, which luckily have been around for a long, long time. 
longer than theoretically there has been this stuff going on. Which suggests that actually, if you start looking through the records and records, this stuff has been going on longer than we like to think about. But maybe it's been more piracy or the fact that letters of mark haven't been really as needed because it hasn't been as organized as it was and there were just the ships that sink ports and various other things it gets it gets so fun i mean if you want to get into the international maritime law the things which you can get away with as a nation state at sea can keep many many lawyers gainfully employed for their entire lives just trying to figure out the full ramifications of what those things could be. This is another issue when it comes to peer, aggra peer on peer aggression, peer disagreement at sea, in that these things can happen. Now, we have the War of Spanish Succession, 1701 to 1715. And in this war, the Anglo-Dutch managed to get a pretty big prize. They capture the Spanish treasure fleet in Vigo Bay, October 1702. That's always nice. It really is nice. But more importantly is what happens in 1708. And that's where this book comes in if you want to read about it. The Cruisers and Convoys Act of 1708, in 1708. Now, the actual text of this act, the actual text of this act, you can try and hunt down. It's very, very difficult to find an actual copy of the text. It's actually one of the interesting things, if you go to the Hansard Millbank system, which used to be very good, but doesn't seem to be working as well, that goes back as far as the 1800s. Actually finding decent copies and decent accounts of that Act of Parliament, which we have so much based on, able to be read, looked at, which hasn't isn't in distilled form, is an archive visit. And yet that Act is what codifies and starts off the codification A lot of the things which are still used to the state, and actually a lot of the rules which are used even in World War One and World War Two, because it allocates regular warships the defence of trade in face of the privateer attacks on Britain. This is put in after the Britain has lost three thousand two hundred fifty merchant ships. This is in the War of the Spanish Succession. In the Nine Years' War, uh, when Jean Bart had been leading the French Dunkirkers, really, um, they lost somewhere in the region of 4,000 merchant ships. You're talking thousands of ships. Now, again, losing them is an interesting factor here. Because, A, that includes a large number of fishing boats. B, sometimes the ships would be taken. Quite a lot of time they would, of course, be taken. Taken back to Admiral Court, or they'd be sold out. And they might well find themselves back to their original owners in the UK. With the same crews. It becomes a form of farming. When it got really out of hand, the 1708 tax is passed. And it's not just privateers being hired to protect the merchant forces, as well as privateers attacking the merchant forces. It's also the Royal Navy being charged to, you have to have frigates available to look after them. And this has an effect on the ships the Royal Navy is building for frigates. Because at that point, frigates had been vessels for trade, protection, uh, trade interdiction more than trade protection. And for scouting, so they were built fast, frigate, i.e. frigate-like, fast, and were basically the eyes of the fleet. 
Well, suddenly you need some ships which you can produce in numbers which are going to be sold enough to stand up to a privateer. Privateer usually has 10 or so guns. So you need roughly 18 guns. Most privateers have 10. Yes, some are bigger. Some have more guns. Than, but some, a vast majority, do not. And so an 18-gun vessel is more than enough. What it really matters is that's the first attempt to try and codify what... Now, it's one thing having a lovely act of parliament about cruisers and convoys. It's another thing realising you have to start funding these things. And you have to work out how you're going to fund them. Now, the thing about trade protection, once you get involved in it, you can't just do it in wartime. You have to also think about doing it in peacetime. So these acts and this development really starts putting in place the infrastructure and the funding which allows navies to develop as they become in the modern age. It was working before you came in. There you go. So, this all carries on merrily and there are updates and things go on through the Napoleonic Wars. And the French, of course, do the guerre de corps strategy by licensing everything they can to attack the British merchant ships. But the British East Indiamen at the time proved to be pretty darn heavily armed. And whilst the French had some success, uh, there were also vessels like the Arniston, which managed to deal with many, many attacks at multiple times. And US and British privateers were just a feature of the War of 1812. In fact, they were probably the largest feature of the War of 1812. What really causes a change in things is the Confederate Raiders during the Civil War. Now, they don't actually cause much of a change by themselves. What causes a change is the Americans deciding to sue the British over the Alabama and the other raiders which were built in the UK to basically allege that the British had supplied them so therefore the British should be sued for it. This, the British, at this point had never been part of the rules. So the British hadn't broken the law but it was found to be not within the spirit of the law. It's a whole commission and there's a this is a whole interesting piece of history which you really need a specialist to go into and all the uh, the things but what it basically boils down to is that this vessel the Alabama was found to have been produced with the knowledge of the British I the British knew what was being built in their yards no matter how much they claimed they had no knowledge of it But the fact is, the British actually come out of the treaty negotiations. They have to pay fifteen and a half million pounds, which was balanced against the uh, two million dollars, fifteen and a half million dollars, against the two million dollars nearly that the uh, USA was supposed to pay Britain for the illegal bu uh, Union blockade practices and ceded fishing privileges. Now, it was helpfully held and discussed in Geneva, Switzerland, and the tribunal was composed of Sir Alexander Cockburn from the UK, Charles Francis Adams with um, William Maxwell Everts serving as counsel from the United States, Italy provided Federico Slopis, Switzerland, Jacob Stumpf, and Brazil, Marcus Antonio de Rujo, the second Baron of Ajuba. This tribunal was what was convened to decide whether or not bring a couple and to what extent. The thing is, 
it establishes the principle of international arbitration. It establishes the beginnings of codifying public international law. And whilst the British end up having to pay this money to the Americans, what it also means is that for future nations, for anyone who builds them that uh, used to attack Britain, Britain can turn around to the presidents and say, you owe us money. So, this can come off as the Americans winning a victory, which they do. Don't get me wrong. But for the British, it's also quite a big victory because it means that them, as the maritime dependent empire and the world's preeminent maritime power, can now use this precedent, which has been convened against them, so of course it has weight, to demand similar from anyone else who gets involved. It's very nicely shut down an avenue of attack by other powers on the British, hasn't it? So, a small price to pay for what works out as roughly $13.5 million. That's it. Seems cheap at that price. You'd pay that much for it, wouldn't you, boy? Yes, you would. So, then we get on to World War One. Now, in World War One, there is, of course, the U-boat campaign, which is often pointed out as being this great commerce warfare, this great act of good, of course. However, it's not actually. The biggest one is the blockade of Germany. Because one is an attempt to interdict trade and, and try and limit it. One eradicates it. And that is what the British do in both the First and Second World Wars. They blockade Germany. They use the prize laws, they use all the laws of Goethe, of course, of economic warfare, and, as, well, as they did to the French, they cut them off from the world. It's what you use your overwhelming power to do. And for the British, it's easier. Why? Because, A, the British are an island sitting across the main sea axes from the rest of the world to Germany. Yes, they can still get Baltic, uh, Baltic trade. Yes, stuff can still come in from Sweden, etc., through the Baltic. But it's far more difficult and far more limiting to do so. But what you can do if you're the British is you can have some older ships sitting off the coast of South Africa or India and any merchant ship which goes past, you can use those rules... Remember those cruiser rules? If we go back to them, you can use those cruiser rules as justification to stop and search. Stop and search might be a contentious issue on land for individual people, and it is a contentious issue at sea, but it's well established as precedent at sea, and you can do it. Well, I mean, the British do it with the Asamamaru off the coast of Japan. Admittedly, that's for making several points during World War II to the Japanese. But it worked. It's... What's there? It's justified. And all is part of this kind of warfare. The legalistic nature of this warfare. And if you're British, what you do is... You have a choice. You can confiscate that material or you can purchase it which is what the British tend to do they purchase all the war material which is going in on neutral ships they find it then they purchase it and it never reaches Germany and that's what matters doesn't it that it doesn't reach Germany because everything they don't get is something they can't do now, for Germany, their U-boat campaign is less effective than the total blockade in terms of stopping stuff. I'm trying to get to. And more importantly, it's destructive, which annoys people more. It really does. So this works against them twofold. 
and by working against them, it undermines their ability to wage war. This is the reason why Gerda course is sometimes viewed as being the methodology of war for a weaker power. But it forgets it's also a large component often of the major powers war plan as well. It's basically a case of if that's all you're relying on, it's putting you obviously in a weak position. But if it's a solid set, a solid pillar of what you're relying on, it's probably going to strengthen you. It's how you do it. And as a stronger power, you can do it in such a way that people can't get as annoyed with you. They're still going to get annoyed with you. They will get annoyed with you. They always will get annoyed with you. But they can't get as annoyed with you. Because you're doing it legally, and you're following the rules. Because the rules work in the larger power's favour. They do work in the maritime power's favour. Because the rules, despite rulings which have apparently gone against them, are written by and for the larger maritime powers. Because they're often the ones with the Admiralty Courts and the time, you know, time money to invest in writing such rules. And it's a precedent-based system. And if you want to change that precedent, good luck. You've got to get international agreements and all sorts of things sorted out. Then we have the Battle of World War II, which of course is famously because we have the Battle of the Atlantic, which is this great economic struggle. But it's more than just the Battle of the Atlantic. It's more. There's also the Arctic, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, Eastern China Sea, South China Sea, Western Pacific. All these have trade ships going through. Sometimes they're Japanese ones being attacked by American submarines. Sometimes they are... Dutch vessels, Dutch merchant ships, Indian, Indian, Indian Ocean being attacked by Italian and German submarines operating from Japanese bases. And sometimes they have Japanese submarines taking part in it. The fact is, one of the reasons why we don't often hear about British submarines sinking German merchant ships is because there are a lot less German merchant ships going around. Because where can they go? They can't go anywhere because there is a blockade going on. And their submarines are sneaking out underneath that blockade to attack the merchant vessels. But their merchant ships aren't going to go through that blockade to get to somewhere to trade with. Besides, where they get that, who are they going to trade with? And then they'd have to get back. In fact, the British would probably actually, if the if they'd spotted it, if the Germans were trying to do it, they would actually have let the merchant ships get out, get loaded up supplies and then catch them on the way back so they could seize their goods and the Germans would have spent money as it was. It would have worked. And yes, it would have had an impact on the war. So, it's had an impact on how things are being procured because naval strategy is often build strategy. If you have GERD, of course, as a major part of your war effort, you have to build ships suitable for it. But you also have to build your merchant ships to be able to deal with it. And this is where things like carronades start to come in, and where the construction of East Indiamen, which just happen to look like Royal Navy warships quite strongly from a distance, of the right sort of rating that they could be somewhere in the goodness knows where, or on convoy duty comes in Spanish war bound two privateers the fortune of war under Henry Adams and the Princess Royal under Daniel Morgan being advertised for in 1796 Bermuda mounting 16 carriage guns on the Princess Royal 10 on the fortune of war. That was a very delicate little cough. Why are you hiding beneath my desk? Ah oh, well. These ships are part of the British war effort. In 1796. That's nine years actually just under nine years considering its date before Trafalgar still part of the British war effort yet if you read most general histories 
of the period, Napoleonic Wars, privateering, good, of course, is the methodology of the French. It's the methodology of both sides. And the fact the French weren't able to defend against it was part of their problems. The fact is the French were blockaded, which meant they couldn't get their frigates and their ships to line out. They couldn't protect their ships. The Spanish also couldn't protect their ships, which stops the treasure fleets running and allows the British to gobble up colonies. Because blockade is as much a part of guerre de course as guerre de course is a part of blockade. Because there is... If you have a close blockade, yes, a blockade, you can blockade a plot and you stop the ships going out. But you also want to gather up the ships which are elsewhere. You want to stop that trade moving wherever it is in the world. Guerre de course works. It's a cost-effective methodology. And it has an impact on construction. It has an impact on also the debate because losing warships, that's going to cause a national scare. The French might invade. That's terrible. That's scary. But ultimately, There'll be some responses, and it'll be done, and it'll be a short-term memory. However, losing a lot of merchant ships, losing a few thousand ships, all that money, that's a very long-term memory. And what's the point in having a navy if it can't defend your merchant fleets? What's the point of having a navy if your sea lines of communication aren't open? What's the point of having a navy if your enemy sea lines of communication are open? To use the modern phrase, sea lines of communication. Which is actually a wrong thing to say. Because it's not lines. It's not little roadways. There are recognized routes, but they're always loosely followed. They're more for efficiency than anything else. And even then, if you've got storms and big waves and currents, that's going to affect your route far more than your direct heading. It's going to make you look very higgledy-piggledy. The sea is one great big communic communicable surface where you can go wherever you like. You start limiting that down, you've created yourself a problem. Either for you the enemy, or you. So what we've got coming? We've got Colin Cameron's. Germany does not invade Belgium in 1914, so UK does not declare war. How does it affect the Royal Navy? It's going to be an interesting one. And then we have Bichon's French War, a French interwar caravation. Why did the French Navy not more fully embrace caravation after World War One? It comes down to money, but also politics. And then 26 January, story of the first fleet, founding of Australia. There should be an ING after founder, shouldn't there? Oh, I love spell check. I really do. And this is the year of technology. Privatizing war, geared of course. It starts off as a way of building private fleets, so you don't have to build a raw a navy. Then becomes over time the reason the navy is justified because of the cost of building those private fleets, basically. It's shifting the burden. One way to try and shift it off the burden of national taxation, the other way to shift it to the burden of national taxation. And I was do finish these with questions, but um, 
I'm not going to because there are so many questions in the uh, 3rd of January's one where I did basically an exam and set up a system of being uh, being able to submit it uh, on to people uh, if, if people wanted. So um, I'm going to leave those questions as questions. I hope you enjoyed the start of the uh, year of technology with um, questions on the year of uh, Cruiser and a uh, bit of an outline of where I'm going with some of these videos. And for steam engines coming up, well, both me and Drac use similar books. Edgar C. Smith's A Short History of Naval Marine Engineering is going to be definitely heavily referenced. Mainly because it's a good introduction for my students. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'm sorry this isn't quite short, but how do I put this? The other two versions have been 20 minutes and two hours, respectively. The two hour one goes into a, went into a lot of international maritime law. And it sounded more like a legal lecture, and honestly sounded like it was going off topic. 20 minute one sounded like it didn't cover enough. So I'm hoping this is right. I think for the maritime law one, I might at some point do a series on international maritime law, but I'm going to wait till I either have the skill or I have someone who I trust the skill of enough to create some very good graphics to back that up because I can't use the graphics I use normally when teaching because they are covered with the university I do the teachings for on those subjects logos and they don't really want me using that stuff for the website uh, for the YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching and hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. Take care. You okay, Mighty Fluff? Don't worry. You do well at bets. <laughs>